Hello, and a very warm welcome to the Late Breaking F1 podcast presented by Harry Yeed, Sam Sage, and me, Ben Hocking. Exciting times. Should we go somewhere next week? Oh, you little munchkin, you little rascal. Where should we go, Ben? Where are we going? I don't know, like Doncaster? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if there was a Texas in Doncaster. That's actually what we've been saying we're going to do for the last, what, six months? We punch you all. We're going to Donny. <laughs> Pick up Donny! We've got Donington. every picture on this show ever. Donnington not- clears Cota. Oh, obviously. Donnington um, not in Doncaster either. <laughs> not at all. Not even close. <laughs> Separate places. Well, can you tell that we haven't had an EF1 for a while? Um, the intro has gone off the rail straight away. But don't worry, we've got plenty to talk about. Got back and forth coming up later on. We've got some comments from James Vowles about his lineup for 2025, uh, a bit on Mercedes and their approach to 2025, some comments from Toto Wolf there. But we're going to start with a little bit of a top five. We're going to start with a top five biggest surprises of 2024 so far. Uh, and we've kept this intentionally quite vague so we could nominate a a, a driver a team an individual performance maybe an overtake absolutely anything could be an off track uh situation as well so we're going to keep it quite vague but we're going to give our top five surprises of 2024 so far sam what have you got at number five i'm gonna be the most vague man in vague town for my first option (laughs) (laughs) motorsport no um i'm gonna go with the 2024 season Genuinely, when we <laughs> covered it off in one, yeah, you know <laughs> and I'm done. one of the biggest surprises of the 2024 <laughs> season has been the 2024 season. See you later. Thanks for coming. I'll see you in Texas. Um, <laughs> no, the 2024 season, I came into this year thinking Rebel Dominance, Max Verstappen was going to run away with it again. It seemed so bizarre the idea that after winning that many Grand Prix the previous season to not having a win now in what seven or eight Grand Prix in a row almost unfathomable, impossible. So to have seven different wingers, four different constructors taking a victory, the fact that we're actually having a championship battle coming down to the wire, a different constructor leading. So many races have brought up surprises or been brilliant. I had great overtakes. It has been a thrilling season and I am loving it. I am absolutely loving this year. I'm actually glad it's a long season. Painful for everyone has to work it all, but it has been bloody exciting. So the 2024 season, big tick, love you. You're like the son of 2012. If you're happy, Sam, I'm happy. That's how it goes. That's lovely. Harry, you're number five. Uh, You'll be not shocked to know that I didn't really put these in an order, so I'll just... uh, Oh, I'm so (laughs) happy. I bet you wrote it four minutes ago. (laughs) Ben's furious. Um... Uh, at number five, but could be also four, three, two, or one. No, you Uh, can't. (laughs) I'm banning that line. Um, I've put little collar pinto bean. Oh, um, come up in <laughs> Frank <Hey>, LCB, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Frank <laughs> LCB. Uh, um, Frank Colapinto. He has been a little, a little, a little tinker, isn't he? A little bit of a little surprise of the season. Um, so I mean, so far we've he's still, he's still got a few more races left, but from what we've seen, uh, he has been he's been excellent, and I, I was I still don't <laughs> necessarily agree with the way that Williams did it, but. You can't say they were wrong. You can't say they were wrong for based on what he's been able to do in the car. And I know it's sort of fallen in line with when Williams have had an upturn in performance, but nonetheless, he's been very close to Albon. I think that's the most impressive thing. So at an undisclosed number, Franco Colapinto. Why do you turn up to this show? It's a good question. Just to annoy him. Yeah. I mean, it works. Hey, works. hey successful. Very successful. 100% <laughs> hit right. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a fair shout because I'm not sure what Williams' internal expectations would have been for Colapinto when he replaced, but I feel like they must have been somewhere near crash the car less than Logan Sargent and give us slightly less of a bill to deal with when it comes to the amount of damage he was doing, but he's definitely exceeded that to this point. My number five, I've gone with a team, Alpine. Not all surprises are good, folks. Um, are, you su- are you surprised? Is that well, a surprise? Yes, I am. I was thinking about it. I actually am surprised about where they are because it wasn't great last year, but it wasn't this. Like, they did score 120 points last year. They did have two podiums last year. Um, and in fact, like, their 120 points in 2023 was their worst result since 2019 when they scored 91. A reminder, folks, they're currently sat ninth with 13 points. 
Um, it's not going very well for them. They've been between fourth and sixth in every season of the championship since 2017. And now they are looking at eighth or ninth this season. I, so it has been a surprise just how much they've they've fallen off. To give you a quick summary as to what's happened in 2024, they released the car at the beginning of the year, which is the size of Jupiter. They then go into Bahrain and they qualify 20th and 19th and they recover it in the race to finish 18th and 17th. They then announced that they're two, like the head of te- the technical director and the head of aero, both going to leave after the first race of the season. Briatore resigns, Ocon's out. They lose out on Carlos Sainz, and now they're not even making their own engines in two years' time. So overall, not great. And I still think, even though this year everything that's happened after the first thing has maybe not been surprising, but if you put it in as a whole versus last year, still surprised me a bit. Sam, number four. I'm going to be really, really boring and keep it really, really simple. Oh, a little... 2024 season. <laughs> <laughs> oh, little 2024 season. No. Little kind of bit of being. Um, you know, I'm not going to dwell on it. Barry's already delivered the points, but the Riz King, um, which every person on the racetrack is falling in love with immediately, um, especially Sergio Perez, yeah. it would seem. He might just give up his seat at this point. For oh, Colop, please. Isn't? Please take it. Please. After you, sir. Please. Please. That guy can really defend. Um, he just staring at his, his rump the entire Grand Prix. Uh, yeah, the, the, the guy's rump from ever being said. Oh, his rump, that's awful. <laughs> then, that's bring, back, the list. bring back the racing, please. Um, chaotic already. Yes, Colo Pinto. He, starting at Monza, and Monza was a bit of a write-off, of course, because we saw how well Nick DeVries did at Monza, and let's face it, that didn't pan out to be the most successful Formula 1 career. So that could have definitely been an anomaly. But you turn up at Baku, and you give an absolute brilliant scrap for points the entire time, and you get them um, brilliantly running alongside the likes of Albon, and then we get to Singapore, and you pull off one of the most audacious starts to a Grand Prix I've seen for a long time. Absolutely sent it. Um, and you so much so that you made Alex Albon whinge over the radio out of fear that he might end up not getting past turn one. Didn't finish the race anyway, but, you know, just delivered. And I'm expecting that he'll deliver again in, in Kota. I've already got such high standards that he will match Albon. He will be there. He will help Williams. Brilliant signing. It's a shame it's going to end at the end of this season, but what a surprise. He's done so much. I really was like, really? This guy? Out of all the people they could have hired when Williams selected him, but... Kick's pretty good, and I, I am surprised in this one. I've certainly been surprised by Colo Pinto. I think he's done a he's done a great job. Um, but whereas he took two races to impress, I'm going to throw someone in who only needed one. Oliver Behrman at Saudi Arabia. Um, I fully appreciate that he was in a Ferrari, which was, even, even though it wasn't like the best car at that time, it was still pretty good. But even so, he adapted really quickly to a car he'd never driven before. He didn't do FP1 or FP2 that weekend as well. He jumped straight in on the Saturday, did FP3, and then qualified. He narrowly misses out on a Q3 appearance. I think he was only about half a tenth away from making it to Q3. And I say only, it sounds like a lot, but he was only half a second behind Charles Leclerc in qualifying, which... Leclerc's quite good at qualifying. So that, given he had no time in the car, that's not bad either. And then in the race itself, he beats Hamilton, he beats Norris. He's not that far away from a battle involving Russell and Alonso. So um, kid's good. And I'm excited to see him next year. Obviously, he does a good job at, at Baku as well for Haas later on in the year. But how last minute that was, I was shocked that he adapted himself as quickly as he did. Harry, number four, maybe, for you. <laughs> Uh, I've put the Miami GP uh, because it was the first time since, uh, I don't know, the early part of 2022 where we had a challenge. Well, Max Verstappen had a challenge on pure pace. And yes, you might argue that a safety car helped Norris out to get the win there. But however way you look at that, he was still challenging Verstappen based on pure pace. And that at that point in the season and where we where we've come from from 2023 and the beginning of 24 which again let's not forget he was very good very dominant in the beginning of the year uh Verstappen that is this was a surprise McLaren rocking up and actually having race winning pace was they threatened it a tiny bit uh, the latter half of last year but yeah this this was a surprise and obviously since then it's gone on to continue and, and McLaren now have the quickest quickest car but 
at the time it's this was a big it was a big deal sam number three uh number three i've got on my little list here upgrades or more specifically lack of ones downgrades. working downgrades insecure grades no one really knowing what they're doing grades all sorts of grades this has been one of the most bizarre seasons i can remember from you know we've been watching formula one for over 20 years now for where things just don't work the amount of incredibly intelligent people in formula one and they're making all these fantastic innovations and changes and developments and they just don't work you know, imagine just coming into your house and going, oh, my oven's pretty old. I'm going to get a new oven. It just doesn't work. You'd be quite annoyed. You'd expect it to work. Oh, okay, that hasn't worked. I, I can cook it in a microwave. I need a new microwave. I'll get a new microwave. It just doesn't work. It spins the wrong way or something. You know, the, the timer goes up, not down. I don't know. It cools the food. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure the spinning motion. Frozen. <laughs> The motion of a microwave is what would be the issue if it was wrong. <laughs> Imagine you hey, saw it. It's classic <laughs> clockwise, anti clockwise. Technology. It's a That's the only part of a microwave that matters. It's on the wrong way, love. It's freezing. It's frozen. Oh, um, God. I'm going to go with the frost. Um, anyway, <laughs> upgrades are so crucial to a Formula One season and a team's development, and, you know, the challenges that we do or don't see perhaps across the Formula One season. So for pretty much every single team to have an upgrade that has essentially backfired on them at some point throughout this season, shows you the margins we're working with are so slim, shows you how experimental they're having to be. And it's just such, you know, turmoil at the moment. It's so up and down. It's tumultuous. No one knows what they're really doing at the moment. You never know what the pecking order is. And a lot of that is to do with the upgrades that are being brought. And it can make or break a season. You look at Ferrari, where they were in going into Canada, and then you look at where they are now. If they hadn't had that series of poor upgrades and developmental sequences, they might have been challenging for both titles for the entirety of the season. It can make or break a season. So, huge surprise. Usually when an upgrade comes in, you see at least a, a, you know, a standard level of improvement, if not a big jump. Many times here, nothing. Uh, Harry was very positive about his last one and how McLaren have, have surged up the field. Uh, and I'm going to do the the opposite and say uh, Red Bull's demise is my number three um, because they were in such a great position to start this season. And I think it's a shock how far they've fallen off. So c coming out of the Chinese Grand Prix, that's the first five races of the year. Um, Verstappen had a 25 point lead over Perez and a further nine points over Charles Leclerc. That was despite him having a DNF at the Australian Grand Prix. In the other four races, he got pole in all of them. He won all of them. And the Japanese Grand Prix that he won by, I think it was 12 and a half seconds, that was the closest that anyone got to him. The other three winning margins were all bigger. Uh, and as Sam referenced earlier, eight races, last eight races, no wins whatsoever for Verstappen or indeed Red Bull. That's Verstappen's longest drought since 2020. Uh, and now they're unlikely to win the Constructors. Newey's out, Wheatley's out. And I can't remember such a demise for a team where everything on track was going so well so early in the season. Um, so yeah, I've got Red Bull's down full at three. Harry, your next one. Uh, snap. I didn't really have a demise, but just... I went more for turmoil of Red Bull just because uh, on track performance dip aside, um, just just the politics around Red Bull this year has been ridiculous. You you two were talking on the last podcast about, I think Ben, you said this, have they agreed publicly on anything at all this year? <laughs> I think the answer is no. Um it's been it's been a, a shocking year in terms of their 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 uh, I don't say reputation, but just in terms of the, their image as, as a team. And like I say, they've lost, they're losing as slash have lost key members. Um, Adrian, you, you mentioned Jonathan Wheatley. We can't forget last year. They lost, lost the big Rob Marshall. <laughs> oh, Rob. <laughs> who's putting up scaffolding elsewhere. Who's now become the patron saint of this podcast. Oh, Marshall. <laughs> Literally the goat of all goats. I love him. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been a real surprise. I think I think performance has been that dip has been a lot, uh, but actually just the off track for a team that's been so stable for so long, the 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 downturn in terms of just losing people and how chaotic it seems there is is mad. Number two, Sam. Number two, I have gone for a team. My my first on my list, and it's um, Mercedes. 
Mercedes have had a torrid time throughout the latest development cycle, the latest regulations that we've seen. So much so that it is being their worst time essentially since joining Formula One again, all the way back in before the teens, right? It's been that long now, over a decade they've been back in Formula One. And you'll, if you've been around a little while, you'll happen to remember that they won quite a few races and quite a few championships in a row. Cut to 2022. They don't really be winging anything anymore. They don't even know what winging smells like. They miss it. It's gone. And yet we get to 2024. Porpoising seems to be fixed. The start of the season is terrible. We're joking about apology letters. Boom. Three race wings. Ah, uh, nothing. Ah, uh, nothing. They've won three races more regularly than Verstappen's won any races. That's bizarre. That's a trend. So the surge and yet drop and then pick up again and then drop on Mercedes has been something I just did not expect i really thought they would continue to struggle completely i thought they wouldn't touch the top again and yet at one point or another we were putting them in the mix for possible multiple race wins could they mount a challenge are they there now the fastest car it has been such a topsy-turvy season that to the idea that mercedes could once again be considered the fastest at one point incredibly surprising so for me their leap to the top and then quickly falling back off again was a real shock Second place for me, I am sticking with the Mercedes theme, but I'm going to hone in on one specific result, uh, and that's Hamilton's win at Silverstone. Um, I guess to your point, Sam, about how poorly they started the year and how all of a sudden they, they seem to be competitive just before the summer break. Uh, and I, I appreciate as well that George Russell did win the race before at Austria, but bear in mind that he was about 15 seconds off the lead when Norris and Verstappen had that crash, whereas... Obviously, Russell and Hamilton were on the pace. They were one-two in qualifying at Silverstone. Um, and yeah, even like you look at some of the other results, they were heading up to this point. They they were competitive enough at Canada, but the first eight races of the year, they had no podiums. Hamilton was technically third in Spain, but he was like 17 seconds off the lead. So there, there really hadn't been any signs to this point that they could compete for race victories, let alone take them. And then Hamilton's performance at Silverstone was utterly breathtaking it was an incredible performance from him so um his first win of course since saudi arabia at the back end of the 2021 season so that result is second for me cut to, uh, cut to me right. yep. crying on stream as that happened <laughs> I, I know you like to do that so <laughs> oh yeah all the time when you're not getting body parts out well, well hey don't spoil it for the viewers well oh god i might have mean, oh god how offensive anyway um, I'm sorry, but mine's complete rinse and repeat. I had Hamilton's win at Silverstone uh, second on my list. I, it does. It felt for a while, and look, mate, you you doubt Lewis Hamilton at your peril, but it did feel for quite some time in this new era whether Hamilton had it. There were glimpses. There were lots of glimpses still of Hamilton. You know, 2018 Hamilton, 2020 Hamilton, but. Not that I don't want to say there was lots of doubt, but there, there you would question whether Hamilton could deliver those sorts of performances again. But Silverstone, he did. He and he proved, he proved why he's a seven-time world champion. And yeah, it was. I think it was. It sounds ridiculous to say, oh, it's a surprise that Lewis Hamilton won a race. It's obviously not because he's Lewis Hamilton. But it just felt it felt like it had been so long since it had happened, and it yeah. was. It had been quite a while, but it, By Hamilton standards definitely a very long time. But it, it, it also, the, the, as you mentioned, Ben, it wasn't like it was a fluky win. There wasn't, you know, uh, weren't circumstances that helped him get that win, like lots of people retiring or whatever. Or, but this was just Lewis Hamilton being a beast, and it was it was a surprise to see that because it had been so long. So I put that down number two. Sam, the most surprising thing of the 2024 season so far is Oscar Piastri. For goodness Ooh. sake. <laughs> Sorry, I knew, I knew that might. Yeah, I'm glad <laughs> I got there first. I've got slightly more on my sentence, but God damn it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the king is absolute, And the fact that even he started the season at quite a mediocre standard, he was off the pace of Norris. So you had a few mistakes. You look back to Spain and to Australia, where there were scenes of him running off into gravel traps and falling behind the leaders and missing qualifying through silly open mistakes. So entirely his own fault. And then we cut to this point, race wings in the bag, many times the fastest person, the most points scored over the last eight Grand Prix. You know, the kid has been groundbreaking we always knew that he was going to be top tier absolutely top tier but i was never expecting it to arrive just this early you know 
It's like Amazon Prime. It's like next day delivery. You don't expect it because you're used to the old ways. Post office, three to five working days. You open your door the next morning, boom. Oscar Piastri's on your doorstep. I already ordered him last night. He's arrived much earlier than expected. And I'm bloody excited for it because the kid can drive. Maybe he should consider scoring more points than his teammate. Oh! Fishing rod out. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. Please, folks, don't come after me. Um, Harry, uh, guessing by what you said, you've got something very similar. Uh, my, I, I had Oscar Piastri's overtaking ability. His ability, his clinical ability to overtake cars has been my biggest surprise of the season. And not because I, I doubt the talents of Oscar Piastri, but again, he's only in year two and he's overtaking people like he's there. He's been there for 10 years. He's just, he just rocks up and does him. And, and there's no contact. There's no forcing him off the road. He just, the Leclerc dive bomb in, in Baku. They're around the outside of the second chicane in Monza on Norris. Clinical moves, but ridiculous moves at the same time. Um, so, yeah, it's it's insane how good he is, to be honest. So he's not, that that on its own is my biggest surprise of the season. I feel like his life motto is just get her done. Nice. He is Cornish, yeah. Lesser known fact. Is he really? Yeah. yeah. Get her done. That's why we love him. Oscar de Melza Piastri is what he's called. Love that. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Very good. I'm going to offer some variety for number one. I'm not going to go uh, with Oscar Piastri. Instead, I've gone back to another team. Haas, where where have you come from, Haas? Pretty damn good. But they weren't looking good last season whatsoever. In fact, last 13 races of 2023, they scored how many points? One. Uh, it was not a good end to last season whatsoever. And preseason testing somehow looked worse. They were multiple seconds off the pace on more than one day. They had the slowest quali sim, the slowest race sim. We all put them last in the Constructors' Championship when we were giving our predictions. And now we head into the season and, oh wait, no, they've actually solved something that's pretty integral to the car and we can fight now, uh, as one great person once said. Um, they, <laughs> Komatsu's been cooking. We've referred to it throughout the season, but I, I know they're not getting podiums or anything, but from where they are to be in a fight with RB to be over 30 points on the season, that is a big step forward. So I didn't see it coming at all. They are my biggest surprise of the 2024 season so far. I love that. Some variety in there, at least. We love a bit of variety. Uh, we're going to take our first break on this episode. On the other side, we've got comments from Toto Wolf. Check if your microwave's going the right way, folks. <sighs> They'll be cooling that food down. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Um, some comments from Toto Wolf about their approach to Mercedes's approach to 2025. Um, the crux of the matter every year is whether you prioritize the season ahead or the next set of regulations. Of course, they'll be coming in in 2026. But Toto Wolf said he'd like to take it from Nicky Lauda's motto when being asked, would you rather win this one or the next one? And he says both. Uh, sometimes it is much less complex than one thinks. Probably the transition of people and capability into the 2026 regulations is going to happen a bit earlier than it would under stable regulations, but it's not going to be game changing. Nobody's going to switch off the machines in January unless you really are nowhere. Uh, but there is nothing to gain because between P10 and P7 doesn't make a difference for us anyway. We are fighting for victories and podiums and cannot write it off. Now, Harry, when we did our three-word summaries for what each team should be looking at for the rest of this season, your three words for Mercedes were time for 2026. So based on that, your thoughts on Toto Wolf's comments? Uh, sure, sure, Toto. Uh, they can do yes, they can do this, and focus on next year and not and not divert all attention to twenty twenty six. But realistically, <clears throat> judging on the and I'm only I'm I'm not being harsh on Mercedes here, um, but going by what they've done in this current era, what and I know this has been. It, by far their best, their best, uh, best year of the of the new, you know, the new rules. <clears throat> Having said that, there's still not many wins for them. But judging by what they've done, what what makes Toto think that suddenly next year they're going to be winning a championship? Even if, even if, best case scenario, they're they're challenging for a championship. Is it worth 
pouring resource into a championship fight for next year that you might you might win you could win you might not win because let's be honest red bull and mclaren are probably going to be in that fight ferrari potentially as well <sighs> maybe um <laughs> lewis hamilton's there so maybe keep him dreaming but at least it, what, it's one. Come it, on. it, the way the way everything's tight has tightened up in F one, it's so competitive right now. Next year, going into the final year of a regulation, as we saw in twenty twenty one, it it gets competitive because the the field is closing up all the time. What? Why? Why pour your money and your resource into trying to win that championship when you could invest fully and concentrate on twenty twenty six? And I'm not saying just abandon twenty five Haas style because look how well that went. I just, I don't know. He's he's been in the game. <laughs> he's been in the game longer than I have, which is currently zero. But it does. It just feels like that's a bit of a risk on on the next set. They they were they were caught out by this set of regulations, and they've been playing catch up ever since. Why risk that again? Because this is a long term thing for Mercedes. They yes, they want to be back to winning ways, but that could happen. Look look how well it went for them in twenty fourteen. Which I might add was not Toto Wolf's be, uh, doing. Just saying. So I don't know, Toto. You, you will probably prove me wrong next year, and then also win in twenty twenty six. But it just feels like that seems a bit short sighted. Seems to be against what they're doing driver lineup wise as well, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> surely you're picking Antonelli for twenty twenty six rather than twenty twenty five. Like he might be very good next season. We don't know. But equally, there's a far better chance that. What Piastri's done, as you've just both demonstrated before the break, is that it does take just over 12 months for this rookie to get properly up to speed. It, it, I don't know. If, if 2025 was more of an option, then maybe he considers someone like Carlos Sainz more, you would think. Um, Sam, your thoughts on the comments? Yeah, uh, God bless Kiki Lauda. Kiki Lauda. And, you know, I love his motivational words and I love what he brought to the sport. And when you say the line, you know, I want to win both there is also, that means that the option is to also win either. And if you are to split your efforts, if you are to split your funding, if you are to split your focus, there is every chance that you end up focusing properly on neither issue and therefore you resolve neither issue. It's not like you've been near a championship every single year continually since these new regulations. It's not like in 2022 and 2023, you were one race win away. In 2024, it's just not gone your way. So you could pick up another, you've been nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. As Harry's already mentioned, in 2014, you nailed the regulation change. Again, Mercedes, not Toto Wolf. But in 2022, you nailed nothing. Nothing. You had such an advantage for year after year after year over everyone. Hang on. They, they nailed not having sidepods. That's true. They nailed a crap car that couldn't stop <laughs> bouncing. You know? <laughs> At a nightclub, it's having a great time. At a racetrack, it's a pile of poo. Could have been better if it was nailed down. Yeah. Get out the nails. You might have tried that. <laughs> Keith, Keith, get the nails. Mercedes needs them. I mean, they haven't got anything right for a long time. And I, I don't understand why they suddenly think that if they focus on 2025, or at least put 50% of their focus into 2025, that suddenly means there's a slight arrogance to it that that's going to be enough to overcome Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari, McLaren rather, not Mercedes, they're themselves. Why do they suddenly think that that's going to be enough to do more than what they've done in the last two seasons and the current one that we're in, where they're still the fourth fastest constructor, they're still a mile away from the other three around them. I just, it is very short-sighted. I think the focus moves away from the driver lineup that they picked up, as you've already mentioned, Ben. You may as well have gone for someone like Science if you want immediate quality. Antonelli will be fantastic. It's going to take him at least a few Grand Prix to get settled in, if not longer, predictably longer. I expect him to be on the same trajectory as Piastri. So while you're trying to pressure him into thinking we could take both championships in 2025, it just feels like the wrong approach at every turn. Focus on 2026, nail the new regulations, and be multiple-time world champions again. You've got the resource. You've got the talented people. You've got the lineup. Get all your efforts into one basket and absolutely nail it. Because I think Mercedes, even without development for 25, would still be the four-fastest constructor. I'd be shocked if the likes of Aston, RB, Haas, Alpine got really near them over a whole season. I think they'd be fine. So for me, you're a fool for focusing on 25. Yeah, it, it comes down to whatever you do, Toto Wolf, don't, don't do what you did in this era because it, it hasn't worked very, very abruptly. It hasn't worked. Like they have won four races in the last three seasons. If you want a reference point, 
They won the first four races of 2020. They, they, they literally have matched the total they had from the first four races of 2020 in all of these three seasons. Um, and look, I, I, from a pure entertainment product perspective, I want to see Mercedes in the fight long term because when they have been in the fight, it's been proven that it leads to some pretty good races because having an additional team in the fight is good for F1. If you want to look at some of the best races of this season so far, I'm sure the British Grand Prix and the Belgian Grand Prix would come up in conversation. Mercedes were in the fight in both of those instances. If they weren't in that fight, they both would have been worse races for it. Imagine, I, I'm not saying the British Grand Prix would have been a stinker, but equally, if it was just the two McLarens scrapping away at the front, it wouldn't have been quite as good as if there were four cars at the front. The Belgian Grand Prix... That becomes quite a, a comfortable victory for Oscar Piastri. So I just want to see them 2026 and beyond actually get in these fights. I mean, if, if Toto, Wolf, Toto Wolf believes he can win both, then great, go for it. But if at any point they have to ask the question, is this going to compromise us in any way for 2026? Just stop that there, there and then. No other questions, just stop. Um, and I did want to raise the point that, that you kind of said, which is, how close are they realistically? Because I know pre-summer break, they were looking pretty good. But equally, post-summer break, they haven't been. Like They've been a long way off. I just want to read off like the four races we've had since the summer break and the closest Mercedes to victory in all four of them. So the Netherlands, 44 seconds off. Italy, 23 seconds off. Azerbaijan, 31 seconds off. Singapore, one minute and one second off the win. Oof, size large. So they have not been, in the last four races, within a pit stop of a victory. They aren't close right now. And uh, based on that, Sam, like, is there something here where we know they were pretty good before the summer break and we know they've introduced some upgrades? Maybe they're just not working. Is this belief internally at Mercedes that actually once they figure that out, they can get back to the front pretty quickly? When has it become the boy who cried wolf? Uh, no pun intended there. Um, you know, how many times across this current regulation set have we said, oh, we just need to work out X. We just need to figure out Y. We just need to make sure that Z works. We'll be there once we sort out this specific issue. It was the side pods. It was the porpoising. It was the developmental direction. It was the oversteer that they were struggling with. And now it's the upgrades that are going on where the setup doesn't work for certain tracks. Every time they seem to resolve one thing, there's another serious problem. They have not at one point understood the direction of this car. They have not understood at one point what are the positives and the strength of this car. They overheat. They can't follow cars closely. They're not quick in any respective areas. And the moment they were, they seem to throw it away again within one race. I don't understand these somewhat arrogant aspects and point of view that they've got here where they think that with a few tweaks and a miracle understanding that they've been chasing for three seasons, that they're suddenly going to be better than these rivals around them. It's really not that simple. There's a lot of money and a lot of effort that's going to go into it, and you really haven't cracked it. 18 months ago, you were issuing apology letters. You still ain't exactly back at the top. To me, put your focus in nail 26 and boy do i feel sorry for george russell who joined that team and it's downfall and still ain't getting nothing out of it can i go back to williams plus please it seems like it's more ambitious <laughs> i know it's difficult to put any sort of checkpoints in harry but like next season at what point do they fully go to 2026 like is it first race of the year they're not on the pace right that's it or is it a quarter of the way through the season, do they get to the summer break? Like, what sort of time frame are you looking at before they should just go, you know what, it's not, this era, it's not been for us. We'll move on. Uh, this is the thing that you, you could do. You could do a quarter, but even then it could be too late because you've got the likes of people, Aston Martin being prime example here. I know they've got to wait for Adrian Newey to join, but everything they're doing is 2026 focused because if it, it the, the words 2025 don't exist in Fernando Alonso's vocabulary. Right, they just don't exist, and I don't think it exists in the team's vocal. They, they are all focused on the, on on those new rule changes, as are a lot of teams. Williams, for another example, I, I would literally three races. If they're not if they're not smashing it out of the park in the first three races of the season next year, give it give it in, give it in. You you give it a good go, guys, but just focus on twenty twenty six because 
I think you wait a quarter of a season, even three races, I'd say is maybe too late, but at least you see where you are relative to the rest of the field. Um, but don't wait a quarter of the season. Just just see where you are after three races and go from there. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Like you say, that time will evaporate very, very quickly. And Aston Martin's a great example because... I mean, it's not just from now that they're looking at next year. Everything they've been doing, in, like infrastructure-wise, has been in place for a couple of years, knowing that this this set of regulations, they're, they're not going to win championships, but maybe the next set of regulations, that's where they can start to win. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, before we go to our second break, just a reminder, if you're not already, we've seen a real uptick in our Patreon subscriptions recently. We massively appreciate And if you're not already a part of the Patreon, you can get involved. The link is in the description. Quick summary about what's coming up uh, this month. We're going to be recording Beer We're Breaking in Austin, so we'll be in the same place for that one. One of your standard episodes that you get every single month as well, we'll be recording that one in Austin as well. Uh, classic review, the poll is just closed on that one, so we'll be looking at the 2003 Brazilian Grand Prix. Oh, that's tasty. Come on! Hey. Harry's a big fan of that one. A uh, very exciting race, so we'll break that one down. Uh, plenty else as well, so you get everything ad-free, of course, uh, and the link is in the description. If, if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. And hey, try it out for a month. If you don't like it, we, we won't be hurt. You can move on, but most choose to stay. So check it out if you can. On the other side, we're going to be chatting about some comments from James Vowles about his driver lineup. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we've got some comments now from James Vowles that he was making on the um, uh, F1 podcast. Um, what's it called? I've actually forgotten the name of it. Oh, it's it's, not, there aren't any. It's just our podcast and nothing else. Podcasts on this show. Uh, James Vowles had the uh, following to say about his 2025 driver lineup. Uh, I think we will have the best driver lineup on the grid. Uh, they're both performing at a very high level. I mean, Carlos has driven against all of the drivers we've discussed. Against Lando, he was successful. Against Charles, up and down, but he's there or thereabouts. There's hardly anything between those two drivers. Against Max in that first year in Toro Rosso, he was exceptional against him. He's been challenged all the way through and held his own, but it's not just that I'm basing it on. It's not in the car, it's out the car. In the short space of time that I've got to know him properly, he drives the team forward. He wants to spend every minute of his time that he can to make this team more and more successful. And that's a combination that is not necessarily available up and down the grid. And Alex is built the same way. Sam, James Wells is very upbeat about his chances for 2025, at least in terms of what the lineup will offer. He thinks it's the best on the grid. Do you agree, sir? You know what? I'd love to. Co- I love co- to commend him for his positivity. Well done, James. I respect the positivity. Now I'm going to break down um, uh, a little analogy that we've had a few times on the podcast because I think it's highly appropriate right now. Ben, what's your favourite supermarket? Big Mo's. Big Mo's. And for those who don't know what Big Mo's is, that's Morrison's. Now imagine if we've got the CEO of Morrison's here going. We've got the best supermarket. We've got the best thing going. Everything about Morrison's is fantastic. Now. He's Fact. got just like, there you go. And there are a few people in the world that will agree. And they'll go, yeah, <laughs> you're Maybe. bloody right. And that's okay. Does it actually make it fat to the rest of the world? No, 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 no. Morrison's like Williams have a lot of good things. Lovely salad bar. They're a nice yellow color in their appearance. They regularly have nice open aisles, which make for a refreshing approach to supermarket shopping. It's just appropriate for both, sorry. Yes. Right. <laughs> Williams have a very strong driver lineup. They have got... Heritage within Formula One and James Vowles and Pat Fry are brilliant and well respected. Don't get me wrong. But does that make it the best lineup? Just like Morrison's, is it really the best supermarket? Ben, of course, a diehard fan, says yes. But actually, you need to look at the industry, look across the rivals. Asda, sensational. Tesco, old school. Get it up, Ben. <laughs> Waitrose and MS. Yes, they're high price point, but they deliver on quality every single time. The issue is... Are we still talking about Williams? What's happening? Yes, I'm getting there. The issue is you're always going to back your horse. And I respect James Rouse for backing his horse or his drivers here in this section. Now we're on horses. What's happening? (laughs) (laughs) My point is, it's the wrong person to ask if they've got the best driver lineup. He's obviously, when possessed to ask or to answer, he's going to say, yeah, I've worked hard to get it, and it's bloody good. And he's right. It's bloody good. They are bloody good. Is it the best on the grid? 
Good Lord, no, it's not. From an unbiased point of view, from an external point of view, we can all have a fair discussion that Albon and Sainz are fantastic Formula 1 drivers and they are brilliant for Williams, especially in their current position in the championship. But is it the best current lineup on the grid when next season you'll have Hamilton and Leclerc and you'll have Norris and Piastri? I just can't see it topping it. I can't really see it being that much better than those guys. It's a great little package you've got there but it is not the best. James Vowles, I respect your, your positivity, but you are clearly having a little bit of a PR chit-chat over the radio. That was, a, that was a journey. I enjoyed that one. I'm glad. At least we know the best supermarket now, I think. That was the end. All right. um, to, to conclude, Morrison's is still the best supermarket. <laughs> um, Harry, your thoughts? Um, On the Morrison's thing. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't forget James Vowles. <laughs> Um, the, uh, what were we talking about? Williams. Yeah, J- I entirely agree with you, Sam. What else is James Vars going to say here? Nah, the, actually, they suck. I've made terrible choices <laughs> and I hate them. What What else is he going to say? Of course he's going to say, yeah, I think I've got the best driver line- lineup on the grid. I know James Vars is re- a realist because I think you have to be as a, as a team principal in F1. And I'm sure he's aware that that's probably not true. However... He's got some grounds to say he's got a pretty decent lineup here. Uh, it, it isn't the best in F1, at least in my opinion. But again, that's an opinion. All of this is an opinion. And James Vowles is entitled to his. And quite frankly, he's not going to say anything to the counter uh, uh, argument. So, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm fair enough in backing his horse, as you say, Sam, uh, or horses uh, or supermarkets. But, yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm not mad at this. <laughs> I cannot be mad at this at this team principal defending his driver lineup, and it's if you look at the Red Bull camp at the moment, it's actually refreshing because, quite frankly, the only person they back there is Max Verstappen. They got four drivers in total. The only one they actually only ever say good things about, yeah, four mate, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, yeah. one team. No, 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 there's two. Yeah. You know the RB oh. and Visa Cash App RB stands for Red Bull. Don't tell Zach Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's kind of refreshing that um, he's willing to back back his driver lineup that that uh, that aggressively, and I, I rate it. I I respect James Vowles a lot too, but you're either wrong or you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also I understand why he would back his own team. Of course, he would equally. He doesn't need to say he's got the best driver lineup on the grid. Like he could have just said something like one notch down from that to say, I think it's the best lineup that we've had at Williams for a very long time, because that's true. And he could say, I've definitely got one of the best lineups on the grid. At that point, I'd say, sure. But to come out and just say, I have the best lineup on the grid. You don't hear some of the other team. You don't hear Komatsu come out and say, you know what? Ocon and Behrman next year best lineup on the grid. He's probably quite happy with his lineup, but I think that's it. That could be a tasty little, little lineup, Ocon and Behrman. But equally, he's not coming out with these superlatives, right? I, I think he could have just taken it a step back because, let's face it, if he was offered Norris and Piastri, he'd, t- he'd take Norris and Piastri. Shh, he would. Um, it, Leclerc and Hamilton? Yeah, he's probably taking Leclerc and Hamilton, isn't he? Um, so no, it's not the best. Like, if you look at the two drivers... Alex Albon, as as good as he's been the last couple of years, and he definitely has been good the last couple of years, Alex Albon, it's a toss-up to decide who is the best teammate that Albon has beaten. Is it Nicholas Latifi or Logan Sargent? Because those are your only two options. Ooh. And he hasn't done it against a better driver than those two yet. Um, obviously, the last time he had the uh, option, he was against Max Verstappen at Red Bull, and he was very much outclassed. Like his qualifying record against Verstappen was worse than Gasly's, worse than Perry. It's the worst of anyone going up against Verstappen in Verstappen's career. So, and I I fully believe that if Albon has a chance like that, again, he will do a better job. But equally, we need to see it first. Again, all we've seen so far is him beating up on Latifi and Sargent, who might be a contender, who might be contenders for the worst two drivers we've seen in F1 in the last 10 years. So um, I want to see that first. And from Carlos Sainz's perspective, I think James Vowles is right that he has, he's not been embarrassed by any of his top level teammates he's had. He's had to deal with Norris and Leclerc and Verstappen in his career. 
but equally, yeah. against Verstappen, I think the scoreline makes it seem more one-sided than it was, but Sainz being three years older than Verstappen, I think helped in Verstappen's debut year. Against Lando Norris, he beats Lando Norris both years there, teammates. That was Norris's first and second year in F1. Does that happen again if you do it in 2024? I'm not convinced. And then, of course, against Charles Leclerc, he's held his own, sure. But equally, if you use any metric you want, wins, points, polls, podiums, qualifying wins against the teammate, wins against... Leclerc is ahead in all of those categories. So, yes, I think it's a good lineup, but I think it's... I mean, this could be an interesting question in its own right. I think it's maybe... I'd take it fifth. List them out. Come on, Ben, list them out. Before that, who have you got? I would take Leclerc and Hamilton over sure. Sainz and Albon. I would take Norris and Piastri over Albon and Sainz. I would take Verstappen and Perez. And even though it's a gamble a little bit, I would take Russell and Antonelli over... That's, that's the one I'm unsure of. It's, it's unsure, but if I'm... Okay, for next season, I'd take Sainz and Albon. If you're asking me longer term, I'd take Russell and... and um, yeah, in that case, I'm exactly the same as you. You think that's about right? Middle of the pack, just ahead of the middle of the pack, Harry? Yeah, I think I'd have... Uh, I I think I'd have him ahead of Russell and Antonelli right now. But I, I, I see your point on... For... Uh, on the future. It's... Albon is going to be a tr- uh, an interesting one to watch next year. Um, the, the early signs versus Colapinto don't fill me with a lot of hope. Um, but we'll see how he how he steps. Are you, are you doubting Albon now? Are you starting to, are you starting to doubt Albon? I don't, I'm, it's been three races and Colin has been very impressive. I'm not basing it off that at all. Uh, and drivers drivers step up. They get Alex Albon has been good. His teammates, as you say, have been Nicholas Latifi and Logan Sargent. And sometimes when your teammates are that that quality of driver, you do, you your game is lower than it it probably could be. Next to signs next year, I. He could step up. I, I'm not doubting Albon's ability, um, but it's just a bit unknown, isn't it? Because his, his the benchmark for him has been Latifi and Sargent. No offense, boys, but um, yeah, we'll see. So for now, I will I will put them ahead of the Antonelli Russell lineup, but we'll see. We'll see where we are then this time next year. I'm sure that will be um, one of the preseason episodes we do at the uh, the top end of 2025, ranking those uh, those lineups. So that was a bit of a preview for you on that one. Let's move on to Aston Martin and Fernando Alonso because he's had some comments about his last two results. The last two results, at least by Aston Martin standards, have been pretty good. Uh, but Alonso doesn't want to get too carried away. The last two se- uh, the last two circuits, they were street circuits. We did good qualifying and then in the race, it's difficult to overtake. So we consolidated those positions in the Grand Prix, but this cannot hide the lack of performance that we are seeing now in the last few events. So we are aware of that. The team is aware of that and is working flat out. Um, Sam, can you understand Alonso's I don't think scepticism is the right word, but just making sure they don't get too carried away by two better results than what they've had recently. I think if anyone has been through the the wheelhouse of ups and downs in Formula One, it's Fernando Alonso. The boy has been through peaks of, of great form. He's had cars that have suddenly excelled and he has driven absolute dumpster fires of vehicles. So he's being a realist. He is being completely down to earth and sensible. And he knows, as we've discussed already on this show today, he knows that right now is not Aston Martin's time. Even a tiny development forward, I don't think it matters to him. As we said, 2025 isn't even his vocabulary. How are you saying it? It's not even in the team's vocabulary. They are aiming for 2026. So even if they do see a, a progression, Where's it going to lead them to? A slightly more successful fifth place in the Constructors' Championship? Right now, it is incremental. It is minute, and it does not matter long-term. Because if they get it all wrong, but that means they ace 2026, Alonso will not care. Alonso, I think, if you said to Alonso now, finish 19th place in every single race, but in 2026, you've got a race-winning car, he'll go, yeah, yes, please. Ha, yes, bye-bye. That's what he'll say. Bye-bye, that's a silly deal. backwards. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> I'm off uh, running away from you until you take the contract off of him. I think he's very sensible. I know we like to laugh and joke about Alonso, how he's a walking meme that takes the mickey out of himself, but the boy knows Formula One 
incredibly well. And he knows that two all right results, which in terms of Alonso's actual success rate, I'm not even that all right. It feels like he's just being sensible, and I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that they're working towards something bigger, something better, something longer term. So, yeah, well done, Alonso. Keep it down to earth. Keep it sensible. Your thoughts on his comments? Is, is pragmatic Alonso your favourite version of Alonso? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> the devil works hard, but the Fernando Alonso self-promotion train works harder. Choo-choo. <laughs> because... Uh, this is just him saying, by the way, guys, I'm excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I am the boss. <laughs> by the yeah, way, guys. You know, these, you know these points? The they're my points. They're not yours. You've nothing Nothing of these are your points. I'm a point scorer. I guess. Um, I'll be the FIA to get the points <laughs> off the constructors. <laughs> yeah, they're mine. <laughs> Give them to me. Fernando Alonso constructor. 11th constructor, Fernando Alonso. <laughs> Still beating Snake. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm sure that there is some... There is some he is being pragmatic here, keeping uh, Aston Martin's feet on the ground. I can't imagine they were floating that high off the ground after a couple of points finishes in Singapore and uh, and elsewhere. So, um, but I it's just just whiff a little bit of I'm doing an excellent job. Those points are because of me. So Alonso, it's just so Alonso. I'm not wrong. He's and not wrong. He's not right. No, exactly. And and yeah. I've, I, it, we've not seen it much here in his Aston Martin career, or even since he came back. This came. This sort of thing would happen a lot when he was in McLaren because he was scraping results uh, at times out of that car, even for things like an eleventh place. Which, to be honest, in the cars he was driving, was actually quite good. Uh, and that sort of thing, those sorts of comments would come quite often. So it does does whiff of that a little bit. I think there is some truth in what he's saying. Obviously, um, I don't think this is a massive, uh, massive upgrade for 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 Aston Martin in terms of their pace but as you say Sam I don't think they're really that focused on it anyway so uh yeah I just oh that man <laughs> I love him he is something isn't he um yeah I, I think he's fair to point this out because Aston Martin whilst they have had some better results in these last two Grand Prix he was lapped in Singapore and he was about 20 seconds off being lapped in Baku. So um, he might be leading the midfield, but that midfield at the moment is a long way from the even the fourth best team, let alone the top three. Um, he has a right to be cautious because if you look at the last couple of Grand Prix, you know there was a Haas one position behind him in Singapore. There was a Williams one position behind him in Baku. There was an RB in Sonoda, just one position behind Alonso in qualifying for Singapore. So the gap between sort of fifth and eighth right now is really minimal. Uh, and that's kind of proven by it's not Alonso and then Stroll one after the other leading the way in this midfield. It's very much Alonso on an island by himself. So, um, yeah, I think he's right. You know, they have taken 12 points from the last two races, which is more than the previous seven combined, but a DNFs have inflated this. Perez not being in position at Singapore. The crash between Sainz and Perez at Baku. Hamilton having to work his way back through the field in Baku as well. So um, it, the results probably aren't as good as what they are looking. Um, so I think it's uh, it's absolutely fair. And you're right. It is more wonderful Alonso self-promotion. <laughs> Can't wait for him to actually have a good car. He's had like one good car for the last like 14 seasons. Ooh. It's quite ridiculous. Ridiculous. So hopefully in 2026, we see wonderful self-promotion Alonso in an actual race winning car. You know what? The the one thing I want is the Bahrain overtake, the uh, the classic one on Lewis Hamilton. I don't want that to be played very often because if that isn't played very often, that means he's done loads of other good overtakes <laughs> and been competing for a championship. If yes. we have to keep going back to that clip, it means that he hasn't had a good enough car to create more moments like it. Monaco living rank free in his head from last year, honestly. Could not be closer to a wing if he tried. Anyway, uh, we'll take our final break on this episode. On the other side, we've got back and forth. Way! Welcome back, everyone. It's time for everyone's favourite segment. It's back and forth. F1. Back and forth. It's F1. Back and forth, it goes backwards, then goes forth, it's F1. Back and forth, F1. Is that a spoiler, by the way, because we're playing F1 back and forth this week, which probably means we're not next Ooh. week. <gasps> Ooh. 
Ooh, I wonder. <laughs> Next week is the live show, folks. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> We're in Texas. Do we not say that? <laughs> Uh, back and forth. So um, the rules are very simple. Harry versus Sam, they'll keep going back and forth on a category with a number of correct answers until one of them can't think of an answer or gives an incorrect answer. I will give you a strike for this one. Oh, that makes it hard. All right, here we go. Um, and there's quite there's quite a few correct answers, but I think we'll rattle through the first half of these fairly quickly. Don't assume um, anything in this don't game, Don't assume ben. anything. We got things wrong off the third <laughs> or fourth many I, a time. I believe in you. Um, I'd like you to name the 25 drivers that have scored at least 100 points in a season. Oh, oh. so to clarify, I haven't changed like retroactively changed any of the point system. So spoiler, you're probably looking for more recent drivers on the whole. Um, the other just a disclaimer I should put in as well. If someone has achieved this in 2024, even though the season isn't over, I have included that. Interesting. You have. I have. 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 Gotcha. No, no knots here, mate. I ain't a sailor. Nice. Might be the worst line you ever said. No, I Easily. rate it. I'm, I'm allowing it. <laughs> uh, one out of two. If you bat 50%, you're doing all right. Um, <laughs> True. Sam, kick us off. Max Verstappen. Max Verstappen has gone over 100 points nine times in his career, essentially every season since 2016 when he joined Red Bull. Harry. Lewis Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton has done it more times than anyone else, unsurprisingly, 16 times. 2007 uh, and then 2010 to now. <laughs> That's insane. Sure. <laughs> Pretty mad, Sam. Uh, Sebastian Vettel. Sebastian Vettel has achieved it the second most times. Uh, 2010 through to 2019, so that's 10 times overall. Harry. Nico Rosberg. Nico Rosberg is a correct answer. He achieved it five times, first in 2010, uh, and then last, of course, in his championship winning season in 2016. Sam? Kimi Raikkonen. Kimi Raikkonen's done it eight times, first in 2005, uh, and the last time in 2018. Harry? Valtteri Bottas. Valtteri Bottas has done it seven times. Um, every year from 2014 to 2021, apart from 2016. Didn't like that year. Over eight. Sam? Yeah. Fernando Alonso. Fernando Alonso has done it nine times, uh, including both years in which he won the championship in 05 and 06. Harry. Michael Schumacher. Michael Schumacher. Uh, first did it back in 1995 when he won the championship, but six times overall. That's Sam. mad in 1995. Yeah, what, what a G. You're getting eight points for a win. Yeah, it's not bad. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a small hint, actually, by the way. Uh, only three drivers have achieved it in the 90s. That's insane. All right. Back to you, Sam. Charles Leclerc. Charles Leclerc is a correct answer. He's done it five times, all at Ferrari, first time in 2019. Harry. Uh, Daniel Ricciardo. Daniel Ricciardo is a correct answer. He's done it six times for three different teams. Sam. What a G. Uh, Mark Webber. Mark Webber, mate. Uh, he's done it four times uh, in, in each of those times. His team won the Constructors' Championship. Harry. Nigel Mansell. Nigel Mansell was Thanks, the mate. first driver to ever score 100 points in a season back in 1992. Very Dr. well done. Nigel. Sam. Uh, really appreciate you picking up the 90s side of things. So thank you. You're um, <laughs> Carlos Sykes. Carla signs, uh, yeah, five times, uh, 2020 through to 2024. Harry. How many, how many are left? Uh, at least 10. Oh yeah, God. at least 10. Ages. 12, maybe. Lando Norris. Lando Norris is a correct answer. He's done it four times uh, every year since 2021. Sam? Oscar Piastri. Oscar Piastri has done it once this season and was the reason I had to put a disclaimer in this game I dig figure Harry uh, yeah we're getting there now yeah getting a bit shaky a little bit you've got you've got four more names that have done it more than once four more names that have done it more than once uh, Mark Webber have we said him I've said that damn it <laughs> you're disqualified well done Brabham the joke thing I'm going to understand oh dear uh, Felipe Massa. 
Uh, Felipe Massa is the correct answer. Six times from 2010 through to 2015. Sam? Jensen Button. Jensen Button's done it four times. 2010, 11, 12. Terrible McLaren in 13 means no. And 2014. Harry? Rubens Barrichello. Rubens Barrichello is one of the drivers that's only done it once, but it is a correct answer. He did it in 2004. Well, that surprises Sam. me. Anyway. Yeah, that, yeah, that does surprise me. Say more about why it surprises you. That surprises me. <laughs> great insight, that. <laughs> Sergio Perez. Sergio Perez, yeah, he's done it seven times, four times for Force India slash Racing Point, and then three times for Red Bull. Harry? Damon Hill? Oh, no. No. Damon Damn. Hill is not on the list. So you were looking for that oh. other 90s name and you come up short, but you do have a strike. So you're safe for now. Sam, back to you. Mika Hakkinen. He's picked out the other one from the 90s. Damn. Yes, that is a correct answer. 1998, he crossed over 100 points. You have five names left, Harry. Oh my goodness. Come on, we could do One it. of them has done it multiple times. Oh, we could do it, Harry. Come on. Um, one of them has done it multiple times. I've I've really forgotten who who we've said. I'll be real. Uh, <laughs> don't say Lewis Hamilton again. Lewis Hamilton, Mark <laughs> Webber. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't think I know. I've got one that is definitely strike territory. Mm. Are they? No, 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 Sam. <laughs> I'll go for. <laughs> How do you do? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'll go for. I don't know. Lance Stroll. Lance Stroll has never hit 100 Damn. points, I'm afraid. Uh, which means Sam takes this win. Any other names? Did Bobby K ever do it? Bobby K did do it. 2010. Oh, Robbie K. Nice. Um, what, four left? Four left. Fisichella? Fisichella never did. Okay. Are they all after 2010 now? Yes, they are. Blimey. Blimey. Hulkenberg? Hulk's never done it. He got a very close one year. I think he got to like 96, but... Never hit a hundred. Always the man that lets you down. Have we he- have we said Grosjean? You have not said Grosjean, no. and Grosjean is a correct answer. He did it in 2013. Good shout. What are the last couple? Uh the last three, I'll give you a clue. They're all on the grid right now. Oh, no. Albon? Albon is one of them. 2020 he did it. Gasly. Gasly is 2021, which means you just got one name who's done it multiple times. Ah, uh, Kevin Magnussen? No. <laughs> Nick Hockenberg. Oh. Is it Mark Webber? <laughs> um, why is my brain gone black? Ocon. Oh my oh. God, why is my brain gone so blank? Uh, Someone's screaming at the radio right now. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, please don't write it. Like, people oh, message no, us so, and say... So uh, <laughs> people message when they're screaming at their uh, speakers when we, we yeah. can't get an obvious answer. Um, tell you, what, you haven't got Valtteri Bottas. Who replaced him? Oh, George Russell. I George thought we said him. Russell. I literally thought we said him. Oh, George. Oh, you said so three times the last three seasons. Sorry, George. Still, I think that's a, that's a pretty good effort. Uh, quite a lot of answers on that one. So well done to you both. I love that. Moving swiftly on to the final segment of today's podcast. It just so happens that it is the greatest segment <laughs> in all of Formula One podcasting. It is the LB question of the week. <laughs> uh, very interesting question of the week. Uh, I'm pretty sure last week we broke the record for number of comments on a question of the week post. And then this week has broken it again. So we're getting loads of interaction on this, uh, particularly on Instagram. So thank you everyone to who has put a submission in for this. The question of the week was, um, who should run against Mohammed Ben Suliam for FIA president? And, and might, might be the first time we've had some actual serious answers. 
There were some serious answers. I did just want to say as well, like we're not just plucking this one out of thin air. This is based on comments by Mohammed Ben Suliam saying, yeah, if you think you do a better job, challenge me, punks. He didn't quite say that, but... No, that is the quote verbatim. The ex- yeah, the exact quote. Yeah. Um, he regularly uses punk in his everyday vocabulary. Um, we're going to give you a little shout out here. K-Dog, Kirstie, she does a damn good job of keeping you lot in check. So maybe that's from Maddie. Yeah, if you um, can do that, you can do anything. Yes, that's uh, so true. Um, Mura on Instagram has just covered off all the bases straight away. Incoming all the Barry Manilow, Otmar's nine children answers. Lol. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, love that. Um, we have a lot of genuinely Sebastian Vettel. And um, yes, I can stand by that entirely. No issues. Yep. Uh, Clive's. Yeah, sure, he'll do it. A few he needs, for Clive's. A, yeah, he needs a gig after December. So no, because sure. we freeze him. We put him in the microwave and turn him and clock <laughs> the wrong way round. <laughs> um, we had quite a few shouts for Gunter Steiner. The swearing will definitely not be a problem. Uh, someone no. said uh, to free Ben Hocking from Alpine and let him run the whole show. Hashtag free Ben. I'll give it a go. <laughs> the amount such of a good job. I've got to shout you out, actually, Ben. The amount of people that shouted out for you was quite... Um, Worrying. Complimentary, I was going to go with, but sure. We'll go with that. Uh, yeah, we should just do, like... Uh, that's a movie title, Battle of the Bens. Only, only one Ben can survive. Like, <laughs> yeah, there was I, a I lot of, like... Um, it's got to be Ben. Not you, Ben Sulliam, but Hocking and things probably like that. Like old school, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't wait to see you two stack up against each other. A battle of wit. Battle uh, of Ben's. Jason Gates has said Mr. Blobby. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Blobby, Blobby. <laughs> I really enjoyed this one that was from, um, that Harry has replied to from Matt Lemmy. Uh, Harry, oh wait, he won't show up. And then Mac replied, boom, roasted. And Harry replied, Argory will still do a better job. I'm Can't argue up. with the entire conversation. <laughs> All facts. <laughs> All are correct. I'll rattle through some th- names that I liked. Um, Matthew Bonner, John Prescott. Uh, <laughs> yes. <Webb> Noah. <laughs> <laughs> Webb Smith <laughs> Noah just put in a gif of Chief Wiggum, so I assume that's the nomination. Ralphie. <laughs> <laughs> Benny. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jackson's gone with Snoop Dogg, which, I mean, Mohammed Ben Saliam's not going to appreciate that because he hates rappers or F1 drivers. I can't tell him apart. Who knows? Um, Casey's gone with Rob Marshall. That's the correct answer. Well done. Um, <laughs> Rob Colin, Marshall, yes. John Burko to bring some order. Nice. Um, uh, A83SM has gone with Liz Trust because she'd never quit. It's literally the one thing she's known for. That's probably not going to work out. <laughs> uh, and then a last one from me, from JD Chapman. Uh, Admiral Akbar or John, John Cena. Cena. <laughs> That's the first time those two names have ever been put in the same sentence. Admiral guaranteed. Akbar or John Cena is so good. <laughs> um, Nicholas Tobe, uh, sorry if I said that wrong, said uh, my uncle Dennis. Yeah, good. Don't, I don't know that. the chat, but don't know. Him. I'm sure. Is he a sure. Could be. <laughs> could um, be. I like this one on Twitter, which brought us all into the game here from Giselle. Uh, all three of you could do it. Ben does the rules, Sam does the TV, and Harry can do the socials on the website. Perfect. You just tick all the boxes. <laughs> Be up in flames in a week. A gammon. Um, mate, a you can't have a <laughs> gammon run of the FIA. <laughs> you know, we haven't had a gammon reference for a while. Yeah, Are you still not... making your gammon? No, I've actually eased off on the gammon, you know? Really? Oh, yeah. I might I might cook one for old time's sake. <laughs> It's like an addiction. You're like 90 days gammon free. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually, I'm sober. Sober from the gammon. Gammon sober, going to gammon anonymous. (laughs) Sorry, lads, I'm off to GA. (laughs) Gammonholics. Yeah, the sandwiches at uh, GA. (laughs) Purely cheese, nothing else. Just just cheese to go, is it? Can't have anything else in there. Getting twitchy. Goodness me. Oh God! Yeah, I'm Cheese could be a good substitute. <laughs> Chicken only. <laughs> Get us out of here, Ben. Oh. I, I do the outro. Last week, last week I had a tuna sandwich. <laughs> no. Oh. Anyway, Sam. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm gonna. Thanks for passing the, the inner reverse carbon to me, Sam. I've, I've got one I can play straight back. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Draw four or do the outro. Yeah, pretty um, much. Holds 84 cards. 
Um, folks, thanks for listening. Uh, we promise that Formula One will be back soon in just over a week. Do join the Patreon, as Ben said. There's a lot of value there. We put our heart and soul into making that content. Harry's trying to make me laugh. And I'm sorry. Always on the push. Go, I'm Harry. sorry. I'm, that last thing. I'm just seeing all the hidden replies. There are three replies that say, Ian the cat. Yeah, Why? <laughs> She's a bad girl. Um, anyway, sorry. Brilliant. Good. Um, yeah, folks, follow us on social late breaking F1, where we're going to be documenting loads of our Texas trip as well. We'll be making loads of stuff that isn't F1 related as well. We've got some cheeky little things coming on Patreon. Maybe going to do a few little tasters of some American treats and takeaways as well. So get your suggestions in of what we should have. Can't wait to be a thousand stone heavier when I leave Texas, and I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, watch us on YouTube, late breaking F1. It's just as funny to see our faces. A lot of you don't seem to know what we look like. So, you know, come and see us. We're gorgeous. Follow us. Um, and I think that's it. Joy the Discord. In the meantime, I'll be Samuel Sage. I've been Ben Hawking. And I've been Gavin Free since 93. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and remember, keep breaking late. <sighs> All right, Tim knows me. <laughs> <laughs>